Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ellen Sachs, and let me begin by saying how deeply honored I am to receive the Pardis Humanitarian Award. I'm especially honored and humbled to be a recipient along with Kay Redfield Jameson and Charlene Sunkel, both of whom I know and greatly desire. Thank you. People who struggle with mental health disorders are not just walking symptoms that can be cured by a pill. Mental health and mental illness involve whole people who live in re relational and social contexts. We need to understand people in the richness and the fullness of their lives. I first became seriously ill as a Marshall Scholar studying ancient philosophy at Oxford University. At first, it seemed like I had depression with mild psychotic features, which is often how schizophrenia begins. But then my illness evolved into a pure thought disorder. Despite much resistance, I eventually found my way to a psychiatric hospital with strong encouragement with my doc from my doctors at the university, whom I had seen at the urging of a neurologist friend. I had graduated as class valedictorian at Vanderbilt University and had been accepted as a Marshall Scholar at Oxford. But I was in terrible shape. I spent much of my time wandering the streets of Oxford, mumbling to myself, gesticulating, and contemplating various ways to commit suicide to rid the world of my evil. I have absolutely no insight into the severity of my condition. I had no awareness that there might be a gap between how I saw myself and how others saw me. I entered a hospital this time voluntarily. After about a week or two there, everything changed. It wasn't something a doctor or a fellow patient or a friend said. It was a simple look into a mer uh, mirror. I saw myself, and I'm going to read from my memoir, The Center Cannot Hold. The, um, it was the first time I'd actually seen myself in weeks, and it felt as if someone had punched me in the stomach. Good God, I thought, who is that? I was emaciated and hunched over like someone three or even four times my age. My face was gaunt. My eyes were simultaneously vacant and full of terror. My hair was wild and filthy, and my clothes wrinkled and stained. It was a visage of a crazy person on the long forgotten back ward of a hospital for lunatics, ending the passage. The gap between who I imagined myself to be and whom I saw in the mirror that day was profound and unavoidable. Far from making friends with my mental illness, until that moment, I didn't truly understand that I had a mental illness to make friends with. That moment, that look in the mirror, was the beginning of a journey that would last over 40 years. I began my first work with a psychoanalyst at Oxford, and it was difficult and painful work. What I noticed from my first experience with intensive psychotherapy is two things. First, my analyst was hugely helpful in diffusing a sense of shame that went along with the thoughts I was having. My thoughts were violent and deeply disturbing about myself and other people. My analyst, who I'll call Mrs. Jones, was able to tolerate everything. It's difficult for me adequately to convey how helpful it was to me to have someone listen, not judge me, and not threaten to put me in the hospital or call the police, as might have happened in the US. Second, I noticed that as I felt more related to my analyst with Mrs. Jones, I began to make friends and found it easier to work again. I want to note and emphasize that the most helpful consultant that I had in England said two things. First, I needed to be in an intensive psychotherapy. And second, I should be back at school as a way to exercise my mind. I will forever be grateful to that consultant. Everybody else was saying I should just walk, withdraw from school and go back to America. I finished my degree at Oxford and I came back to the States to study law at Yale. My transition was rocky. For someone not familiar with a psychotic illness, it's difficult to understand that at this point, I still didn't really believe I had a mental illness. I thought was that I was different from other people, not in a good way, but that through the exercise of willpower, I could tame whatever was wrong. Quite literally, like one has a wild horse in a corral that you must tame. The challenges I framed it at that point in my life was to take that woman who I'd seen in the mirror and tame her and groom her. Or maybe just make sure she's always stayed at home uh, when I went out. She wasn't my friend. 
Shame is a pervasive experience of people with psychosis. Often, we're ashamed of what we're thinking, and so we hide our thoughts from other people. Shame undermines relationships, and it can stop a relationship from growing. Healing does not occur in isolation. It's painful to me when I speak with mental health professionals working in community mental health centers who measure the caseloads in the hundreds. I have a good friend who is a psychiatrist at uh, Westside Clinic. She had 350 patients. How on earth do you do that? Healing begins in relationship. A person's relationship with a mental health professional is an integral part of the healing. I worry tremendously that this point has been lost on our policymakers. Of course, other relationships are healing as well. After I was hospitalized upon returning to the US, I took the rest of that year off, what would have been my first year at law school, and then I returned the following fall to begin again. It was when I began Yale Law School a second time that I made my closest friend and a man named Steve Benke. Steve is an attorney and a clinical psychologist with an appointment at Harvard's Department of Psychiatry. Reading from the text. One of the worst aspects of schizophrenia is the profound isolation. The constant awareness that you're different. Some sort of alien, not really human. Other people have flesh and bones and insides made of organs and healthy living tissue. You are only a machine with insides made of metal. Medication and talk therapy allay this terrible feeling that friendship can be as powerful as either. Steve and I were in contracts class together and a couple of times he asked me for an assignment. Other than that, we'd never really spoken. But one night we were in dinner, at dinner uh, at the law school and the conversation that night was casual and pleasant, drifting from one subject to another, classes and law journals and summer jobs. I noticed that Steve seemed engaged enough. He nodded, he smiled. But after a while, it began to look like simple politeness. As our classmates got up to leave the table, I realized I wasn't ready to go just yet. And there began one of those conversations that last for a lifetime, one in which there was immediate comfort and acceptance, the equivalent of someone's strong hand offered to you when you most need to grasp it. That first talk flew far and wide how we got to Yale, who our families were, then philosophy and religion and what mattered to us and why. Steve had majored in classes at Princeton where he was named the salutatorian of his class and spoke in Latin at graduation. The summer after graduation, he worked as a janitor at a small town airport, and then he went off to Rome where he lived with a group of Benedictine, Benedictine monks and read Latin at the Vatican with a monk who served as the Pope's Latinist. He considered entering the monastery and studying medieval philosophy, but decided against it because medieval philosophy had ceased to hold his interest, at least as a lifelong endeavor. Instead of becoming a monk, Steve came to Yale Law School. And so did I. And neither one of us was quite sure why. <laughs> Sometime later, it occurred to me that at the very moment I was being tied to a bed in a psychiatric ward, screaming blood or bloody murder and afraid for my life, Steve was singing Gregorian chant in a monastery overlooking the ancient city of Rome. And here we were now, come to the same place from two very different directions. It was past midnight when we said goodnight, and as I walked back to my dorm room, I had the distinct feeling, in the middle of my usual muddle, that I'd been unexpectedly brought blessed. I don't know why I decided to tell Steve the truth about myself. I don't know why I thought I could trust him, but I did. I believe from our very first conversation that this man would be a significant friend and a force for good in my life. Once the possibility came to my mind, I realized how much I wanted it to be so. But I didn't believe that could happen unless I revealed the truth about myself and let him see me in full. So much of what I did on a daily basis was about faking it. I knew I would never fake it with him. And so on a rainy afternoon in a pizzeria in New Haven, I shared my history. Apart from doctors and therapists, it was the first time I'd ever done that with anyone, anywhere, ending the passage. I didn't feel shame with Steve. Without his support, I could never have made it so successfully through law school, if indeed I could have made it at all. Healing takes place in relationship. As wonderful as Steve was and is, he was a friend like a brother, quoting from the text. When it came to my personal life, after my illness had quieted down somewhat, I started nurturing a fragile but growing hope for a relationship with a man named Will, a librarian at USC and an artist. I had tried flirting with him to no avail. Who knew how to do that? But after he left USC, he invited me to lunch. 
And then he invited me to see the California Poppy Reserve in Lancaster, not far from Los Angeles. I kept saying how cold I was, hinting he should put his arm around me, but he didn't pick up on it. And I was feeling quite deflated. And at the end of the evening, he kissed me a long, lingering kiss goodnight. And the thought that I had, and this is really the thought that went through my mind, was, huh, this is even better than getting an article accepted. At the right moment, I told Will about my illness, and he responded as gently and kindly as a person could. If Steve's friendship had made me feel human, Will was making me feel like a woman, and in the passage. When I arrived in Los Angeles to take a teaching job at the University of Southern California, my psychoanalyst and I developed a way of talking, a sort of heuristic about my illness and my relationship to my illness. There were, in our informal manner of speaking, three needs. We're not talking about different personalities as in MPD, but just different aspects of myself. So first there was Ellen, second there was Professor Sachs, and third there was the lady of the medical charts. I could not integrate these three aspects of myself. How could I be a thinker of big thoughts, an academic, if my mind were so damaged? How could I be both Professor Sachs and the lady of the medical charts? And where did Ellen fit in on all this? What took a huge amount of effort and what was uh, ultimately self-defeating was to keep them separate. There was no relationship among them. They were not my friends. I wasn't sure who was the real me. This confusion expressed itself in an intense, intense ambivalence toward taking my medication. For many years, my motto was, quote, the less medicine, the less effective, unquote. Steve was a virtual saint as he spent literally years of our relationship going through time and time again as I tried to get off my medication with disastrous results. It wasn't simply that I didn't like the side effects of the medication. The need to take medication reached deeply into the core of my identity. If I could get by without medication, I wasn't really mentally ill and the lady of the charts would disappear. Only Ellen and the professor would be the, the real me. This uh, cycle culminated in one final effort to get off my medication several years after I'd been on the faculty at USC. It was an unmitigated disaster. Ultimately, it landed me terrified on the floor of my doctor's office, curled up in a ball, writhing in psychotic agony. The experience began to crack the wall of my denial. And then another event pushed me past the point of no return and accepting that I indeed had a mental illness. I got on a new drug, a new generation of antipsychotic. For the first time in my life, it seemed possible that something was indeed different about how my mind works. Seeing a difference allowed me to accept the difference. I was finally able to integrate the three parts of myself. I was indeed Ellen, the professor, and the lady of the medical charts. Without shame, I extended a hand of friendship to my schizophrenia. It was making friends with the lady of the charts, my mental illness, that allowed Ellen and the professor to flourish and enjoy the many wonderful relationships that have blessed my life. I have been enormously gratified by how my memoir, The Center Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness, has been received. With monies from a MacArthur grant I found at the Sachs Institute for Mental Health Law Policy and Ethics at USC. The goal of the Sachs Institute is to translate ideas into action to better the lives of people with mental illness. We are your sisters, your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your colleagues, and your friends. We want, in the words of Sigmund Freud, what everyone wants, to work and to love. With a little help, or perhaps a lot of help, from you and your colleagues, we can find a life worth living. Thank you very much. I am deeply honored again to accept the Partisan Award.